I would just like everyone to pause for a moment, have a look at this image, and see what it comes up. What, what does it bring up for you? It might be you have a young child at home that nicks your phone to watch YouTube and you miss your text messages and your phone calls. It might be that you have a teenager at home and they grunt at you because you have too much, uh, they have too much screen time. Or it might give you some fear and anxiety about what are all the terrible, scary things that children and young people can see on the internet. Well, I'm going to turn that on its head. I'm going to show you how we can use it for positive good. I'm going to show you how we can use technology to put the child's voice at the center of the child protection system. I want to start by sharing a story. It's a real story. It's from 2009. It comes from a serious case review. There were three children who were siblings, who were moved from their birth parents, who had um, from something called the toxic trio, where there was domestic abuse, mental health, and drug and alcohol problems. And these children were failed by our system, not just once, twice, but repeatedly. They were removed from their birth parents and were taken to their adoptive parents. In a period of nine years, they were systematically abused, emotionally, physically, and neglectfully. And those three children over a nine month period tried to disclose that abuse 18 times. There were 16 staff in three primary schools that had concerns, shared it with the police, didn't write it down, and didn't give it to the social workers. GP, health staff in hospitals had concerns, shared it with the police, but didn't make a referral to social, the social work, workers. The eldest boy, this always gets me, this bit, jumped out of his bedroom window and kept running away till he slept rough on the streets. The social worker from the out hours team and the police officer didn't believe him and sent him back home to the abusive family. These children were so scared to be yet believed again, have been trying to uh, speak up. And then finally, and thankfully, they were, and they were removed. And we have something called a serious case for you, a very long investigation. And that investigation and review concluded that we should help children disclose abuse earlier. So I am Dr. Sarah Karlick. I started my early career as a social worker. I then went on to do a master's degree in arts health to use creative methods to train and win consultancy for professionals and volunteers to recognize the signs and symptoms of abuse. So I'm known as what is a safeguarding expert. And safeguarding is, it has two sides to it. We have early intervention and prevention, where we want to help children and families at the first sign of any issues or problems. And then obviously we have child protection, where we want to protect children who are at risk of, or the likelihood of, of being at risk of significant harm. But I kept going back to that story, and I kept looking at the children of today, because this picture shows us that these children are digital natives and they are the children of today. So I went to do a PhD at Lancaster University and I'm gonna share some of those findings with you today, which is about a conceptual change of how to put the child's voice at the center of our child protection system. To put this into some context, those children in need of early intervention or protection Last year, there was 404, 710, 100,000 children in the UK as children in need. That's a 4% increase on 2017. And out of that number, 55.8% were of the age of five years to 15 years old. And only last week, the uh, broadcast regulator Ofcom gave us some more statistics saying that it was five-year-olds to 15-year-olds that are spending 20% more time going online to watch videos and watch the, uh, television. So how do these children get through that front door to those protective services? Well, they have to be referred. 
So out of those hundreds of thousands I've just mentioned, 29% were by the police, 18% by schools, 15% by health services, and 38% with other. The three main referrers are the same agencies that failed those children from that story that I told you about. And other could mean housing, a legal person, it could actually just be your neighbour next door. But the point of that is that we do not recognise, we do not record, and we don't see children walking into a social services office going, hey, I'm being abused. What they have to do is go through an adult. They have to find a trusted adult, and at that point, they tell that adult their story, their personal story, and what's happened to them gets lost in translation. And what the adult does to get through the front door if they have to fill a form out and make a phone call. And on the other side of that door is something called a safeguarding hub, where the police, schools, education, social workers, health, housing, all sit together as a hub of protective services. Now, I sat in one of them and observed what happens to that children's story, what happens to their information. And what happens is that form gets chopped up in all little bits, the children's information, and ends up being fragmented through a database. And it also gets cut and pasted time and time again, going round in a circle between all the services. So from there, I went to speak to some children, young people, run some workshops, and treat them as equal, equal partners in the process. And what they told me was the ultimate theme of what their digital day worries, what they worry about most, is death or dying. This is an image from a 13-year-old girl from one of the workshops that I ran. So is it surprising that mental health and anxiety with young people is on the increase? And you would think that there will be some technology to support them. You would think there will be loads of apps to help them. I have 150 apps on my phone. And I say, when you leave here today, just count how many apps you have on your phone and have a think about how many of those apps actually are there to keep you safe. So I thought, the next part of my research, we'll do a search. There are two million apps available on iOS and Android. I did a search excluding controlling surveillance GPS tracking apps. I put the word in, child protection, safe, risk assessment, decision making, mental health, information for young people, child abuse. And in 2014, it returned 54 apps for me to analyze. And in 2017, there were 62. And out of those 54 and 62, they weren't even all for children. They were for parents, professionals, volunteers, a way to record statistics. And out of all them that I analysed, the very small number, only two were actually co-produced with children and asked children what they really wanted. So I went back to my workshops with my children and young people and I asked them, what is it that you would actually want? And one of the fundamental things that they wanted is the word safe. Sounds simple, but the child line app is called For Me. So when I was doing my search, it was really hard for it to come up. They want things in real time. They want digital immediacy. They don't want to pick the phone up and ring 999. That's sort of old hat. They want a button on their phone that can go straight to the police and tell them when they're in immediate danger. They want information, advice and guidance 24 hours, seven days a week, but in two levels. They want a one platform that gives them content and information and education about how they can keep themselves safe. And that should be generational. So if I am a five-year-old, it should be in the look, the feel, and the content of how I am when I'm five, and that should move with them as they grow, whether you're 10, 12, or 15. They also want to be in total control of when and how they share their information. They appreciate and they understand that those protective services are there and they want to access them 24 hours, seven days a week. 
I just want to share with you another key finding, another disconnect with the children of today and our protective services. When I observe these professionals in this hub, what they first do, they want to know what is the child's name, what is their address, and what is their date of birth. And you know what we tell our children in our schools? Whatever you do when you're online, do not give your name, date of birth, and address. We couldn't be more far apart in the way to communicate and the language that we have with the people that are meant to look after our children. So how am I going to bring change? We have to move into the child's world, and that has to start with government policy. We need to take the social care and the digital and combine it together. We need to put social care tech on the map. It barely exists. And if you compare it to health tech, health tech's everywhere. We need to raise an awareness within schools, and we need to challenge the way the police, social workers, health, how they work. I'll give you an example. Social workers work nine till five, and then they go to an emergency team after five o'clock. And what the kids are telling us, but they want to speak to them 24 seven. I am leading the world's first Children's Safeguarding Digital Cooperative Design Centre. And what that is going to do is to put the child at the centre by those children being able to tell us about the functionality, the usability, the design principles and processes of what safe technology could be like. It will treat them as equal partners in the process. It will offer innovation and it will stay fresh because it will have longevity because as children grow up, more children will pass through and it will keep the content fresh and relevant. And behind that, it will be linked to the MeSafe app, which is the first safeguarding digital platform that will have a safe, secure, multifunctional, multi-layered technical space. It will also sit as a digital front door. So we're going to communicate and use the way that the children of today communicate and enable them and their voice to come through. So if we take the social and the technical and combine it together, we can create a safe, educational, technical space that children are able to learn educationally about being safe and mitigate their own risks, and also put their voice and be able to self-refer at the center of our system. And what tech will be able to do and is going to do is be able to have a massive social impact and positive outcomes for children and young people to keep them safe. Thank you.